Okay, we were talking about uh, steel. The last time was sort of a recitation. Now I want to talk about a little bit more about productivity. And so I was thinking a little bit about productivity this morning of, of steel. I've actually thought about it over the years quite a bit. But, but this morning I decided to graph it. So if anyone's looking for a senior thesis, here is the, the outline for a senior thesis. Of hours per ton on a log scale, and I already pointed out when they were making nails in 1600 by hand forging, it was like 3,000 person hours per ton. I mean, that 3,000 hours is 60 hours a week. People didn't work 40 hour weeks back in 1600. They, they needed to eat too, okay? Um, and, but it was consolidating iron. You, we couldn't melt iron at 1600 degrees centigrade. We didn't have the technology until Bessemer came along. And so people would start with spongy, solid state diffused iron, or they'd start with cast iron and just keep beating it in the forge until they burned out most of the carbon and they ended up with something that was a high carbon steel. Uh, and they made swords out of that. But they had to, had to heat it over and over and over to burn off the carbon that's in the cast iron. So Bessemer came along in 1856 or whatever, and he taught us how to melt steel, and I'll show you that in a second. Carnegie came along and became the richest man in the world ever, okay, in, in today's dollars, uh, because he just applied economies of scale. And I've estimated some of these numbers in here. I have no idea what the productivity improved from 1600 to 1800, but it, I'm sure there was some improvement in productivity. They built larger furnaces and things like that, and they learned to do things better, but it was a, a gradual increase. But when we learned to melt the metal, that's why Bessemer was, Bessemer's invention was so great. We now could burn the carbon out in the liquid state, get much faster kinetics for all you material science kinetics folks. Carnegie came along and actually, he made a lot of money, but he probably didn't improve the productivity all that much. It was still very much labor intensive. All of this was labor in intensive. And then um, some of the numbers I do know, um, back probably in World War II or something, uh, we were up here in the number of tens of hours per ton, still labor intensive. I do know that in 1975, when I worked in the steel industry, it was about half labor and half raw materials and energy was the breakdown in the cost of a ton of steel. So it was 50-50, but then we came up with the basic oxygen furnace, the continuous caster, mini mills. This was all process technology, and we dropped from, let's call it 10 hours a ton in 75 or something like that, to something that's about a third of an hour a ton in 2013, okay? So we've had, this is all process improvement, and it's changed the whole landscape. It used to be how cheap was your labor, um, and now it's how much is your energy cost. Because raw materials and energy cost are directly related too. You know, you gotta use diesel fuel to, you know, run that backhoe or whatever and, and truck the stuff to market and things, okay? So um, if anyone's looking for a senior thesis, this could be, you know, talking about the productivity and what caused the productivity and the changing, anyway. Um, it wouldn't be much of a doctoral thesis, but it'd be okay for a senior thesis. That should be very good. So let me tell you a little bit about um, what a Bessemer converter is and why it helped things. Uh, a Bessemer converter, you've heard of Sir Henry Bessemer in 1856. He learned, and I didn't know for years, he, you, had to, you make cast iron in a blast furnace, but it's got like 4% carbon in it, and it's very brittle. Um, and you can make nice castings and pots and stuff, but that was all you could make, and you could make wrought iron by hand forging it. But in any case, it would you couldn't melt steel. Well, Bessemer came up with a, a steel vessel, it was a riveted steel vessel, that um, you basically would blow the air in on the liquid, and he had a little lip here on the end, that, so that when the gas came out, it had to pass the gas coming in. And what that did, it preheated the air coming in. And the temperature of the, the, the maximum temperature you can get for a flame burning in air with most hydrocarbons is about 1,000 degrees C. Maybe you get 1,100 degrees C, but 
the nitrogen in the air just keeps the temperature down. That's if you start with room temperature air. If you started with 1,000 degree air, you could get an extra 1,000 degrees, right? This is this sort of obvious. But it wasn't obvious to everybody back then. And I'm not even sure if Bessemer realized what he was doing, but basically he had a way to preheat the air by having the exhaust gases pass by, by it. Today, a heat exchanger expert would call this a counterflow reactor because the air is going one way and the exhaust is going the other way. It's counterflow. Okay, big deal. Okay, so Bessemer did that, and now they can get those extra five, 600 degrees Fahrenheit that you needed to melt steel, two, 300 degrees centigrade. You could melt iron. Now you have the kinetics not of diffusing carbon out of iron in the solid state. You have diffusing carbon out of iron in the liquid state. And all you material scientists in here, what is the, how many orders of magnitude is there between liquid state diffusion and solid state diffusion near the melting point? See, you never learn anything practical, okay? Typical liquid state diffusivity is 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6 centimeters squared per second, okay? Solid state diffusion right, you know, just under the melting point is like 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 12. So you get seven orders of magnitude in increase in uh, reactivity time, okay? Reaction time. That's pretty significant. Seven orders of magnitude, that's a productivity increase. So what Andrew Carnegie did, he started making open hearths, and so you would have this container that would hold the, the iron ore and everything, and you want to melt it. And this thing would be uh, the size of three of these classrooms in area. I mean, just in a thin layer of steel because you're going to blow the gases across here. I didn't have the gases blown across here. Okay, so I'm going to blow the air in here across the surface and I want lots of surface area. This wasn't a very deep bath, a shallow bath, lots of surface area because I'm still getting a reaction at the interface between the air and the liquid. Except the air would first go through some brickwork. There would be some brickwork next to the blast furnace or the uh, open hearth furnace, about half the size of a football field and about two stories tall. They would just make a lattice work of bricks inside a, a, uh, a building or, you know, and they would blow the air in through these bricks and combust it, okay, with, with the fuel, which was probably um, coal gas. And then they would exhaust it out the other way through this other brickwork, heating up these bricks, doing nothing initially to these, but heating up these. And then about twice a day, they would reverse the flow of the gas through the brickwork. So they're going to preheat the brickwork, which is going to end up becoming when you reverse the flow and come the other way, okay? You come the other way with the, with the air later, six hours later, you're going to preheat the air by these hot bricks, okay? And that was how they got preheated air rather than the Vesmer converted, converter. Now this technology is still used today in glass making. Okay, in glass making, for you can't have any carbon around. Carbon gets in your glass, and you get black specks. Okay, in your glass, people don't like that. So they actually use natural gas, slightly oxidizing flame, so you don't have any carbon soot particles. But they want to get a high enough temperature, so they actually still, and I've walked through these in glass factories as recently as 15 years ago. I walked through one. Um, they have this big lattice work of brickwork, and they run the gas through this way to heat up and have the exhaust gases going through another set of brickwork. And then sometime later, when the bri those bricks are hot, they reverse the flow and put the cold gas through the hot bricks, and then have the exhaust going through the cold brickwork, okay? And you just keep reversing the flow, and you can run these glass furnaces for four or five years at a time, okay? Unless in this particular one, they had one of the reversing doors where they have to <laughs> they have these big steel doors. They have to lift to, it's basically just a big valve to shut off the gas. And one of them got hung up. They couldn't close it. And they just started overheating their brickwork. They couldn't, they couldn't close it. They had to close it within five or six hours. Couldn't do it. Had to shut the whole thing down. And it takes about three, four weeks to start it back up. Okay, so lost a lot of production because 
of just worn, one worn out door, door rung. A, a time of who? Well, yeah, and there's actually a good PBS special on Carnegie, okay, that actually goes through this. Other people were doing it. He was just pretty good at um, beating down um, uh, the labor cost, okay? I mean, he was actually a wonderful man in many ways, okay? Uh, he, he loved education. That's why we have Carnegie Tech, you know, Carnegie Mellon University and stuff. Uh, he, lots of libraries are named after Andrew Carnegie. He only had 13 months of education, and he always felt deprived, and so he wanted to make education available. In fact, my grandfather got money out of it. I didn't tell you my story of my grandfather and Andrew Carnegie. Then. So my grandfather was born during the Civil War in the South Carolina, and it turns out my great-great-grandfather is probably the richest man in the South. He owned, I don't know if I should say this on tape, but he owned over 300 slaves. Okay, and he gave my grandfather a slave when he was born, and that slave kept my grandfather alive for a year during the Civil War when he got separated from his mother for a whole year. Anyway, so my grandfather uh, had sort of an interesting life. His father became governor of South Carolina after the war and then became secretary of the treasury and ended up in New York City on Wall Street or whatever. My grandfather ended up in Chattanooga, Tennessee as the mayor of Chattanooga, and he decided Chattanooga needed a university. So he, he got John D. Rockefeller, and I don't know how this worked, but to commit $250,000, if they could raise another $250,000, they'd have a half a million dollars to start the university. They went all through everybody in East Tennessee, and they were still $25,000 short. So my great-grandfather, who had been Secretary of the Treasury, knew Andrew Carnegie, and got my grandfather and another guy an audience with Andrew Carnegie. See, if you ask this story, I can tell my other stories, right? So it turns out, uh, so my grandfather took the train to uh, New York, and he met with Andrew Carnegie. And uh, this all comes from my grandfather's autobiography. Anyway, he said, Andrew Carnegie said, well, I tend not to dabble in John D. Rockefeller's charities. Okay, so he's basically telling him no. And as they were walking out, my grandfather said, you know, the people in the South really need a better, need better education. We just don't have schools and stuff after the Civil War. I mean, this was a combat zone, right? Uh, it had been bombed out or burned out. Um, and Andrew Carnegie looks at him and says, how much education do you have, sir? And my grandfather said, 13 months. And he says, you come back tomorrow and I'll give you my answer. And come back tomorrow at 2 o'clock. So my grandfather comes back with his colleague at 2 o'clock. And they knock on the door and the the guy opens the, the butler opens the door in New York City and says, and uh, says, who are you? And my grandfather says, Thomas Thompson. And uh, he says, oh, Mr. Uh, oh, and my grandfather says, we've come to see Mr. Carnegie. And the butler says, oh, Mr. Carnegie left on the 5 a.m. train for Pittsburgh. Oh, OK. So my, he says, who are you, sir? And my grandfather says, Thomas Thompson. And he says, oh, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Mr. Carnegie's fifth secretary will talk to you. So he goes in, and the fifth secretary gives him a check for $25,000 and says, Mr. Carnegie wants you to know he also only had 13 months of education. Okay. So in any case, and my grandfather wrote that he figured if he had 12 or 14, he wouldn't have gotten the money but because he had the same number of months. But anyway. Um, but Andrew Carnegie, how did he get to be successful? He just beat those labored and just ran them as hard as he could. Uh, so he wasn't the greatest employer, okay? And he was pretty good as a businessman at cutting deals with the railroads, because that was your big market, and cutting deals of buying out other, you know, uh, foundries and other things that were steel mills. So he was sort of just uh, like businessmen today, making conglomerates out of other things, okay? I think he was probably a pretty good businessman, but he, and he was a great, educational benefactor, but he, I'm not sure you'd want to work for him, okay? Anyway, um, what happened in about 1956, actually from about 20 years from 56 to 75, but in 56 in Austria, remember we had bombed out their steel making, uh, and so they didn't have any open hearth furnaces, and these things were cost a fortune. I mean, these are, you go to an open hearth site, I've only seen one or two in my life, but they're huge, and they cost a fortune of capital equipment. Well, some people in Austria got the idea 
well, let's build something that looks like the Bessemer converter, but let's blow pure oxygen on it. And so they made a small one of like five or 10 tons. Nowadays, we make them at 300 tons. And they're huge. They're about six stories tall. And they, they will build an oxygen plant. Someone like Praxair or Air Liquide or Air Products will build a facility right next to your steel mill because you will buy all the liquid oxygen they can produce. And they sell liquid nitrogen so people can freeze their cucumbers, you know, freeze cucumbers, green beans or something, anyway, corn. Um, so they blow pure oxygen, and this 300 tons of steel actually forms a froth of about three or four times its volume. So this little, that's, I drew a, a little bit here. All this volume sort of fills up. It's a water-cooled copper lance, and you better hope that water-cooled copper lance doesn't start injecting water into the vessel because you know what happens when water hits liquid metal? It explodes, okay? You get a steam explosion. So they do a lot to design these copper lances so they don't, you've got basically water coming in here at you know, tens of feet per second to cool this off so it doesn't melt. Forms a froth and you can now refine that steel in 30 minutes of what used to take hours or 24 hours of just typical cycle time because you've lots, got lots of surface to volume ratio, okay? So it turns out U.S. Steel in all their great uh, wisdom in the early 70s built the world's largest open hearth of 450 tons. Everyone else in the world was putting in BOFs and so they ran their, their hundreds of millions of dollar open hearth, the last one in the world, um, largest one in the world for a few years, and then they realized they had to put in a BOF, okay, because anyway. Actually, U.S. Steel did come up with the BOP, where actually the QBOP, uh, sometimes basic oxygen process, BOP, where they actually inject the, the, the air from underneath, okay, which has certain advantages so it wasn't as if they didn't develop something but you look at some of the productivity gains here and you're seeing factors of 10 or 20 or 50 um, by these process changes so if I look overall between 1975 and where we are today over 35 years over my lifetime you basically and I stole this out of another metals magazine maybe it was the same one I showed you the other day Here's the, the converter, the basic oxygen furnace. There's the, ox the oxygen coming in. You can see it says slag, but you do have a slag in there, but the whole thing forms a froth. Um, and then you have to get some, you've blown in, you've got lots of oxygen in this thing, won't make very good steel. You have to degas it. You can degas it by argon bubbling, or you can degas it by pulling a vacuum on it. They do both. Or you can just cast it as is, and you get another type of steel, but usually, that would be ingot casting, but you're going to go to the continuous caster nowadays. You've got to get the oxygen out. So, um, because if you didn't, you'd end up with Swiss cheese for your steel that you continuously cast. But now we can make that in 20 or 30 minutes. It actually is about a 40 minute process because you have to do the chemical analysis before you pour it. You've got 300 tons of steel. You don't want to pour it and solidify it and find out it's the wrong composition. Okay. So there's a whole business in that. Can you get an analysis, a detailed analysis of steel in five minutes, okay, from molten steel to, you know, a hundredth of a percent of all your alloying elements? Um, because you're talking about $100,000 an hour or something of profit in this vessel. So minutes count, okay? Anyway, you, you pour the, the liquid into a ladle, and then the ladle goes to a tundish, which is just a bathtub to hold the stuff, so you get a nice manifold, if you will, of flow. And you melt the molten steel. You've got a mold, which is water-cooled copper, and you have rolls, and the steel is still hot. In fact, it's still got liquid in the middle. And you roll it because this whole thing is going to be about six or seven stories, maybe ten stories tall in order to have a large enough radius to roll this 10 inch slab of steel, okay? Um, and then you, you have to cut it on the fly and they will run continuous casters for a year without shutting down. Is there any danger of contaminating steel and copper? No, um, this is actually a detail of the copper. This is the, the tundish, okay? 
which has a little slag layer on it and stuff. It actually freezes against the copper. It's water-cooled copper. The startup can be a little dicey, but you only have to start up about once a year. <laughs> okay. And once you get running, you actually, because of the cooling, the stuff pulls get away from the copper. Is there a problem? Yes, you can sometimes get a little copper contamination before the thing starts oxidizing and forming a little slag layer and stuff on the initial startup. And that can cause what they call uh, copper checks on the surface. And so the first 50 tons you cast may just go back into the, be remelted. Okay, so the answer is on a continuous basis, no. On a startup basis, yes. Okay, does that answer the question? Okay, yep. Yes, I'm going to show you that in a second. Show you, I got pictures. Okay. Um, they didn't originally. They would just do rectangular bars or round bars, mostly rectangular bars because it's easier to bend them, um, or slabs, which would be a up to 10 inch thick slab by eight feet wide or something like that. that you're going to take directly to, but they now roll I beams. Okay. Uh, and these are all some of the details that go along inside this bath. They show the steel kind of wavy here and it has a skin. And if you have a breakout, breakouts are really exciting in a continuous cast. That means the skin broke and you dump about 50 tons of steel on the ground. So you don't want to be walking under one of these things, just in case you have a breakout. Um, it, it will kill you. Um, and it typically will shut the caster down for several weeks. You're talking a four or five hundred million dollar machine here down for weeks you're talking millions of dollars of loss okay uh, so far as that goes um, so uh, but running continuously for a year at a time okay uh, lots of productivity uh, gains there so if you start looking at there were several gains there was um, the BOF which we went from 24 hours to burn the carbon out of the steel to about 20 minutes or 40 minutes. Um, 20 minutes to actually burn it out and another 20 minutes to wait to get your chemistry back and pour the steel and everything. But the cycle time is about 40 minutes. You melt 300 tons of steel every 40 minutes. Okay, start figuring the profit on that. Um, and then the um, continuous caster. Continuous caster and the BOF all came in around the 1960s. The American steel mills, they were still using 1910, 1912 technology. Okay. Did I tell you the story of my being a young engineer at Bethlehem Steel? And they, they, had, they had a meeting for, for, for one or two weeks in the, the summer. They took all 500 of their new college hires, whether you're an accountant, but people graduated from college. And they very much segregated those who had college education from those who didn't, basically the hourly workers from the staff, salaried workers. It was a real, you know, rich man, poor man type of society there. Uh, but um, they, would, they would put us in an auditorium for half a day, and then in the other half of the day, they take us down to the plant, and we'd actually get to see how steel was made on large scale, which is pretty dramatic. You also learned why you went to college. You didn't want to have one of those jobs, okay? Uh, wonderful hospital where my second child was born because the steel company had built the hospital for all the iron workers who had lost their arm or their leg, you know, in accidents. I mean, it was just a factory to, to maim people, okay? Uh, back in the old days. Nowadays, they all sit in the air-conditioned offices with computers and anyway. Uh, but back in the, just 40 years ago, it was it was a real hellhole to work in a steel mill. And in Andrew Carnegie's day, it was a lot worse. Um, but in any case, they, uh, the rise, the next big rise in improvement, the thing that dro dropped it down to 30 minutes a ton or 20 minutes a ton for production was the rise of the mini mills. About 1975, some guys looked at the price of scrap and they realized you could buy steel scrap for $100 a ton. And it cost $180 to make cast iron. And someone said, hmm, $80 a ton extra profit on a $300 a ton product, sale product, I could make money on that. But they had to, they couldn't build these huge things. They started building small steel mills 
that might only cost $250 million rather than $5 billion of capital equipment. And they built these things and they used electric furnaces. And that's where the, the big steel companies all laughed and said, ha, you can never make good quality steel out of an electric furnace. Um, you have to have virgin iron ore and, and all this other stuff. They laughed at them. Well, the mini mills make about 60% of all the steel today. They just kept on eating away. So if you read something about, well, anybody heard of the book, The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen? None of you have heard of it. About 10 or 12 years ago, this was the, the greatest thing in business management. Uh, Clayton Christensen is a professor at Harvard Business School, and Clayton uh, um, uh, was writing this book in the mid-90s, and he's got three examples of the innovator's dilemma. And the innovator's dilemma is whether your digital equipment trying to build mini computers where an IBM is trying to make mainframes you're coming in at the bottom of the market and the the innovator was IBM making computers and they started making bigger and bigger and fancier and fancier and more expensive computers digital equipment came in and took over the bottom end of the market and ate away at things until many computers got to be as powerful as you know powerful enough for desktops that's one of the examples another example is the mini mills taking over the, the integrated steel mills I can't remember what he had three examples it became in the top 10 on the New York Times bestsellers list and all this other stuff. I'm actually referenced in there because my daughter, one summer while she was in college, got hired by Clayton to do some research. And she was supposed to find out what it cost to build a steel mill. And she came home one night and she said, Dad, I can't find anything. I've been looking for a week, can't find anything about the cost of building a steel mill. And do you, have, you know where I could find the data? I said, well, I've got a slide I can give you. And so the next day I brought in my slide, and that's why I'm referenced. And I estimated that it cost Bethlehem Steel in 1965 through 70, $5 billion to build the Burns Harvard Indiana plant. And I think I told you, since then, no, com no private company has ever built a steel mill because it would cost 10 or $15 billion today, maybe $20 billion to build an integrated steel mill. Only countries have back bankrolled that. And I mentioned that's the same thing with Boeing and Airbus, you know, designing a new airplane, Intel putting in a silicon foundry. These investments get so large that it has to be a country that subsidizes it uh, because no co company can take that type of risk. Well, in any case, um, you wanna know where the data came from? I sat there in Saginaw, Michigan at an airport with one of my graduate students after vid visiting G GM back in the early 90s. And I said, I said, well, I was thinking about this problem of integrated mills and mini mills and, and stuff. And I just scratched out the numbers. I just pulled them out of my head. But they're right there in Clayton's book. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanted to know where's the reference, well, actually, I'm probably as good a reference as anyone else, you know, what the heck. Anyway, so you wanted to know what happened to the mini mills. The mini mills originally wanted to make the garden variety, the cheapest stuff is concrete reinforcing bar. It just has to be the right size diameter, <laughs> and it's got the lowest price per ton of virtually anything. And so this company called Chaparral Steel, which was started by a guy, Gordon Ford, who's a graduate of this department back in 1975. He saw the $100 scrap price versus $180 cast iron price. And he was one of the guys who said, you can make some money there. And he started Chaparral Steel down in Texas. Um, and anybody know how to spell Chaparral? Yeah. Anyway, as Gordon says, you only pee once on Chaparral. Uh, a lot of people try to put two peas in. Anyway, um, Gordon's actually a great talker. Uh, anyway, so this is one of Gordon's slides. And they started out, instead of square slabs out of the continuous caster, these were the first slabs that they made that just had kind of notches to reduce the amount of rolling in the rolling mill. And Chaparral was going beyond rebar, they were going to try to get into the business of structural shapes. And eventually, they got, I don't know if this one will even show up. It's not going to show up. Uh, let's see. Oh, you can kind of see, here it is. 
This is what's coming out of the continuous caster as of about year 2000. Oops, have I got it? Yeah, you can see the, here's the I-beam shape. It's almost an I-beam, but it's actually cast. Um, but in fact, um, they were very successful such that in the 1990s when everyone else was importing steel into the United States, they were exporting steel to Japan. They were down in 1990 to one person hour per ton. Net shape casting of structural drove costs down by one third to the point that concrete could no longer compete against steel for building construction. Um, well, I'll talk about four strand rebar rolling. The new facility they were gonna put in was gonna be, in 1990, was gonna be 0.8 man hours per ton. And they had sales of $450,000 per employee. Why is that important? Anybody know what the typical sales per employee of a company is, manufacturing firm in the United States? It's about $150,000 per person. In fact, I had a student do a thesis at the Boeing Door Product Center once. This is where they make the doors for the aircraft. There's five or six doors on a, on a 737 or a 747. There's the door you walk in. There's often the door on the other side where they bring the catering in. There might be a couple of them. There might be three or four emergency exits. There's usually a rear door, you know, a ramp and stuff. There are all kinds of different sizes from the emergency exits to the, the full-scale door. And in the cargo planes, they have doors the size of a garage door, okay? So, but the door manufacturing center at Boeing was a very interesting business. It was the completely deterministic manufacturing. You knew what your order book looked like three years ahead and it only took you one year to make the doors. Because the aircraft got ordered and they started laying the keel of the aircraft three years ahead of time and you had three years to get your doors made for that aircraft. You may not start until you know two years later but you knew exactly how many aircraft were going to be built and how many doors are going to be needed and what their shape was going to be and everything else. And they, they operated it in accounting at Boeing as a cost center. And I said, well, what's a typical door cost? Because every rivet hole they drilled three times. Full, first a rough drill, then a reaming drill, and then a, it was a third time, I can't remember what it was, to get everything just right. It was all hand work. A guy with a drill, okay? And I w watched all this and said, what's it cost to make a door? Well, we don't know because we're we're a cost center and we don't, you know, we only sell to Boeing, and so there's no price change. And I said, well, how many employees do you have? They said 250. I said, well, how many doors do you make a year? They said 750. I said, oh, okay. Your doors cost on average $50,000. And one of the managers says, oh, yeah, that's probably about right. They didn't have a clue what their doors cost, okay? Um, but I could figure it out because I knew that typically at Bo Boeing, you had about $150,000 sales per employee. You better have $150,000 sale per employee in most manufacturing firms because if you're going to pay the guy 60 or 70,000 and then pay the overhead on top of that, it's going to be $90,000. You better have something for materials and everything else and making a profit, okay? If you only have $70,000 sales per employee, you're going to be out of business real quick. So $450,000 sales per for an employee per employee is a very good business, okay? used to be one of the metrics I would use when I worked in manufacturing over there. Um, of, without people knowing it, I would ask, you know, how many employees, what are your annual sales? I'd do the division in my head, and I could figure out right away whether this was a good company or not. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe that's the problem. Okay. Um, the sun has come out. Okay. So... Let me tell you about four strand, four strand rebar rolling at Chaparral. Chaparral was a very interesting company because it was the first company I'd ever been to when you, if you asked, if they made a mistake, and you, I used to ask the question, I said, well, who got the blame? For the first day that I was there, people would look at me funny, like, what do you mean blame? They didn't understand what blame was. Wait a second, give me a break. The managers are always blaming the employees. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, they, didn't, they just didn't understand what I meant. It turns out I was there for about two days doing a study with a guy from Harvard Business School. And the, uh, the second day I figured it out, or that night I figured it out. At Chaparral, you didn't get blamed for trying something new and failing. 
you got blamed for not trying something new. Okay? They expected you to innovate. They had, you go through every shop and on the, on the wall they would have that week's profitability and sales. And you got a bonus based on that, those sales. So when they went out and bought equipment, those people felt like they were spending their own money because in a sense they were. They took ownership. This is one, Gordon Ford set up a great management system. He, he had a corporate dining room, which was not quite as fancy as the chairs and tables here. And we would have, they bring in a barbecue from some takeout place in Texas. And that was the corporate dining room. We'd eat with plastic forks and spoons and stuff. But I mean, the barbecue is okay and nothing wrong with plastic. It works for forks and spoons. And um, that contrasted to Bethlehem Steel where they had a special, I never got to eat there, a special executive dining room at the research labs. We had a very nice dining room, but it wasn't nothing like the executive dining room. And it didn't have the quality of food of the executive dining room, okay? There's a great story, the only one I remember in Iacocca's book about Ford, uh, Henry Ford or whichever Ford it was at the time that was chairman of Ford Motor Company while well, Iacocca in the 80s was, used to love hamburgers. And he'd eat, wherever you go around the world, he'd, he'd have, he always wanted a hamburger for lunch. And he came back and he said, you know, I never get hamburgers anywhere near as good as I do here in the Ford corporate executive dining room. So Iacocca wanted to figure out what was the chef doing, what was so great. And so he goes back afterwards, he says, what makes the hamburger so great? The guy pulls out a ribeye steak, prime ribeye steak, puts it in the meat grinder and said, here. <laughs> so just quality of starting materials. That's our philosophy at MIT too, okay? Admit good students and you probably won't screw it up too badly. Okay. Um, so the, the guys at, at Chaparral, another thing Chaparral did, they forced their production employees to spend one week a year with the salespeople going to visit customers. And they'd say, they'd ask the customers, well, what is it you need and, and whatnot? And so the guys in production would know what the customer wanted rather than hearing it through the grapevine. That was the philosophy. Well, when they went out there, they found that rebar comes in, in sizes. Uh, number three rebar is three-eighths of an inch. Number five rebar is five-eighths of an inch diameter. The smallest rebar is three-eighths of an inch. And it turns out they found out there was like a 20, 30% premium per ton for three-eighths inch rebar. And they decided we want that extra profit and we want to come back and run our rolling mill faster to get the extra profit for making 3 8 inch rebar. The problem with 3 8 inch rebar, you can't make very many tons when it's only 3 8 of an inch diameter. You can turn out a lot more tons at 5 8 right? 5 8 is 25 over 9, almost three times the tons per inch if you're running at the same rate. Um, I was squaring, right, to get the area. You guys all figured that out, okay? There are these little tricks. You already know these things, okay? Uh, anyway, so they went and they tried Typically, a steel hot, hot mill is running at 60 miles an hour. So they try to speed up 70 miles an hour. It turns out there's some instabilities. The stuff starts getting waves in it and stuff when you go too fast. And they tried. They couldn't run it faster. So one of them got the bright idea. Well, why run it faster? Let's run it slower. And let's break the steel into two strands. So here's one strand coming in. And it goes through here, and they actually take the hot steel, and here they split the steel into two strands. And another guy got the bright idea, well, if we can do that, we ought to be able to take the two strands and split it into, if you can see it, four strands. And here's four strands at the top. So they slowed it down by a factor of two, but got four times the, the output, and they got double the productivity, and they took over the 3 8 inch rebar market. Good for them. Um, so this kind of, I um, can't remember your first name again. Out. Pardon me? John. Huh? Johnny. Johnny. So Johnny said his dad always told him to go horizontally. If everyone's going up, go horizontally. Well, I'm sort of, if you're going up, go backwards. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it is. Don't go in the same direction as all the other lemmings. Okay. They probably don't know what they're doing. Uh, actually, they probably do know what they're doing. 
and they're going to beat you. Okay, so let's go to another material for a while, and I'm going to talk about turbine blades. Okay, and the productivity of turbine blades, and the productivity is not necessarily the manufacturing of them, it's the operating temperature. For every 50 degree Fahrenheit increase in operating temperature of the, that jet engine, there's about a $5 billion a year savings to the commercial airline industry in fuel. Okay? It's just thermodynamic efficiency. You learn, you know, delta T over T is your thermodynamic efficiency of your heat engine. Okay? Sophomore thermo. Okay? Um, get a higher delta T, get a higher maximum T, you're going to get more efficiency. Well, back after they invented the uh, jet engine in the 1930s, didn't do too much. They did have jet, Hitler had some jets and uh, the V-2 rockets and some other air, aircraft jets back in the uh, end of World War II. The ME-262 is the first. The first German. And that was the Germans, right? And then we killed a lot of test pilots until Chuck Yeager brought the speed bar. Anyway, but yes, I mean, we, were, we had jets after World War II based on German technology. Yeah, okay, so I didn't know it was the ME-262, but they were the, the buzz bombs and all this. Anyway, they, were, they thought they were going to turn the tide uh, after D-Day by being able to bomb London again or something, okay? But they didn't. Anyway, um, uh, jet engines were operating at about 800 degrees C, 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. They were using materials like stainless steel, cobalt. They started getting into cobalt alloys, uh, nickel-based alloys, uh, and these are the metal alloys and the uh, operating temperatures. This is the firing temperature, which is hotter than the actual uh, thing. And you can see that until about the 1970s, the firing temperature was following the material's maximum temperature. And this was all metallurgy improvements, okay, course three. And then started to be a big divergence. And uh, the firing temperature, what, what happened in here, this actually turns out to have been metallurgy too. They went to directional solidification. Um, actually, it was a guy who had been a faculty member here, Bud Shank, um, who went down to Pratt & Whitney. And there's a guy here who wrote a little article, Tony GME, GMA or whatever, who's retired from Pratt & Whitney. Here's the turbofan, showing a nice turbofan engine here. But if you come over here on this page, he shows, and I remember Professor Fleming used to have these same three, um, a little plaque with these three things back in the mid-1970s when this stuff was all kind of new. The conventional casting gave you a fine grain or a grain structure that wasn't fine grain, but the, in creep failure, which is how these things fail in service, they fail along the grain boundaries. In fact, I thought he had a picture. Here he has a picture of metal failure at the grain boundaries. Okay, the grain boundaries are the weakest part in creep. And so first thing they did is they just did directional solidification and they got the crystals all growing this way, the stress is that way, and so the grain boundaries are parallel with the stress and so they're not harmful. Then they got to single crystals so they had to grow these things very slowly, and Professor Fleming's uh, and others worked out that it's the growth rate divided by the thermal gradient, G over R value, um, uh, that is important, and you can get, but you're now growing things, it might take you a whole day to grow some of these single crystal things. Uh, here's a little plot that he's got in there that is exactly just a more complete version of what I just showed you, metal temperature capa capability. You had conventionally cast, you had columnar growth, you got single crystals going off like this from 1980 to 1999. If you look at this firing temperature, oops, this is all directional solidification that allowed these things to happen. And then they got to air cooling. I've shown you the single crystal that has the air cooling on the inside. And that's why you got this big jump here. 
So right now, the firing temperature is about 3,000 degrees. The melting temperature of the alloy in the engine is about 2,400 degrees. If you lose your air cooling, your engine melts. Yeah. Oh, these things, this is aerospace stuff. This is, these materials are worth five to $10,000 a pound in the engine. I mean, the average cost of the airframe might be 200 on a military engine. It, who cares, it could be 1,000 or $2,000 a pound for the cost of the airframe and whatnot. But the engine is worth more because it spins faster, okay? So the energy cost here is insignificant. This is all processing equipment and time cost in this business, okay? In steel, it's all energy and raw materials today. In this business, well, it's, it's partly raw materials. Now it's getting to the point to get these best single crystals, CSMX4 was like a 6% rhenium alloy. Well, rhenium's a platinum group metal. Pretty pricey. I remember taking Nick Grant's course. Nick Grant was the guy who was, who was a professor in this department. He made his career after World War II on high temperature creep, and he was developing some of these alloys that people were using. And I remember taking his course the first day of class. He came in and says, what's the most creep resistant material to make a jet engine out of? And we all started guessing about different alloys and stuff. He says, platinum. Melts at 1700 C, okay. It's got a lousy density. Density is important in a jet engine, but doesn't oxidize at high temperatures. And platinum is the best metal. Of course, it was all laughable because everyone knew that platinum was too expensive to use in an engine until, the 19, until around 2000 or 1995 or 2000. And we started putting CSMX4 is like 3% rhenium and CMSX5 is like 6% rhenium. And remember those little pigtails that I passed around? Dr. Belmar talked about. I said I wanted those back. They're about 6% rhenium. You didn't realize those are about a pound and about 6% of that one. There's an ounce of platinum. Those are about $2,000 a piece. What did we find? About 20 of them down in the lab, okay, when we were cleaning it out. I, I collected two. I told everybody else to, not to throw them out. I don't know if you scrapped them, but they probably got $1,000 a piece worth of platinum group metal in each of them, okay? They typically recycle them. But anyway. Um, so the jet engine business, um, it's both metallurgy, if we, if we go back to early days, it was metallurgical composition, then it was metallurgical processing, and then it became air cooling, which is a mechanical thing. So since I only have two minutes left, I'll tell you a story of, so I'm sitting on a committee about seven or eight years ago, the Air Force had asked the National Academy of Sciences to run a study of uh, how they should spend their $300 million a year research budget in propulsion. And so they were about one of the biggest NRC committees I've ever been on. There were about 35 of us. Two of us were in materials. One was Neil Payton, who used to work for uh, Time At, and then myself. And I was sitting next to this one guy who was the designer of one of these first air-cooled engines guy from Pratt & Whitney. I mean, he, he was in charge of designing that engine. And other people on this committee, they were all the chief designer of most of the engines of the last 20 years. Pratt & Whitney, Rolls-Royce, General Electric, we had all these designers. And so, first meeting, you're going around the room, and they asked us, what would be the most valuable contribution to get higher temperature engines for the future? And I'm sitting right next to this guy 85 years old, famous person in designing engines, and I was all ready to say, look, we've really ex exhausted the limit of our materials technology to go to higher temperatures, and we're going to have to improve things by design as opposed, you know, air cooling and stuff, as opposed to pushing the limits. I'm thinking of this graph, okay? But he's speaking before me, and he says, We've really pushed the limits of design, and we now need better materials. And I got United Technologies Board of Directors to spend $18 million of their own internal money developing new niobium alloy, oxidation-resistant niobium alloys. And I thought, well, I, 
<laughs> I had to change what I was going to say so I didn't completely contradict him, but also say, well, we really have a challenge in materials to go much further, okay? Because we do, okay? People have tried niobium alloys, the, um, but make an oxidation resistant niobium, if you know anything about the reactivity of niobium with oxygen, I could have told the board not to spend $18 million on that stupid project. They spent the $18 million and they got nothing, okay? Well, it's because, and people have been trying. I mean, they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to come up with higher temperature alloys, but these refractory metal alloys are very, very reactive. In fact, sometimes they're called refractory alloys, sometimes they're called reactive alloys. I mean, titanium, you get above 900 degrees um, and it just, it, it will go on fire, like a flare, okay? And they burn out engines because the compressor blades are made out of titanium. And if you don't run the engine properly, instead of the compressors being at eight, seven or 800 degrees, they can get a temperature spike up to 900 degrees, ignite the titanium, and now you have, you just melt through your engine and you end up with a, an empty core. It doesn't fly very well at that point. So in any case, um, we're really pushing the limits, but the, the really interesting thing, I'll take two more minutes. The Air Force explained what their goals were, and their goal was to have a Mach 17 non-man rated engine. Now this, if it's non-man rated, basically this is for some cruise missile or something. And I said, so you're gonna go Mach 17. We already go Mach 17 in space, what's the big deal? No, no, this is in the air, they wanted to go Mach 17. And I said, well, have you ever heard of frictional heating? Okay, I didn't say that. But um, the problem is, when a spacecraft at Mach 17 is coming into re-entry, what happens? They have to have these carbon tiles that, you know, um, that uh, absorb the heat. The frictional heating will give temperatures of 3,000 degrees centigrade. There are limits to materials. There are only so many materials that melt above 3,000 degrees centigrade. I can count them on one hand. Go look at the periodic table of how many metals. Tungsten at like 3,300, and I think iridium at 3,100. I mean, there's a, less than five that melt above 3,100. Now, there's ceramics, but even that, they were talking about skin temperatures of 4,000 degrees centigrade. And I said, well, I said there's a limited number of materials. Well, we're going we're gonna to water cool the skin. Well, let me explain water cooling the skin. Okay, water cooling, cooling the skin. They wanted to do this for the National Aerospace Plane in the, the mid-1980s. Um, they were gonna have about a three millimeter thick piece of copper, and they wanted copper for thermal, uh, th for thermal properties. They're gonna have liquid hydrogen as the tank of the fuel on this thing, and they're gonna have 4,000 degree or maybe back then, it may have only been 3,000 degrees centigrade frictional heating in air on the outside. Now, you want to rely on that? If you have a leak, what happens when hydrogen comes in contact with air at 3,000 degrees centigrade? Kaboom, okay? This was, these, there's people at the Air Force who dream these things up. And they spent billions of dollars trying to design a national aerospace plane. Well, they were gonna do scramjets to get Mark 17 in air. And I, I, I was sort of stupid. I said, well, they, another one of their goals is they wanted to have a plane take off, be light enough, take off and fly 25,000 miles around the globe and land. And I said, well, wait a second. You should only have to go 12,000 miles to get anywhere in the world. And they said, no, no, we cannot expect to have any bases in the future anywhere other than the continental United States. No one's gonna let us have an air base anywhere in the world in the future. So we have to be able to take off in the United States and land back in the United States and go anywhere in the world and bomb them within so many hours. Okay, that was their goal. Well, a nice goal, but I don't know who I wanna pay for it as a taxpayer. Um, and the scramjets, I said, why do you need to go Mark 17 in the air? They said, well, this is a few years ago now. It's like eight or 10 years ago. We once found Obama, uh, not Obama, Osama bin Laden, <laughs> different, different, uh, uh, Middle Eastern name, uh, Osama bin Laden. And if we could have gotten the ordinance to him in 20 minutes, we could have taken him out. But we didn't have anything that was fast enough to get the ordinance from one of the carriers into where he was. They located him, 
but they had to get it there in 20 minutes. And they would need something that could go Mach 17 in order to get into Afghanistan or Pakistan or wherever they had found them within 20 minutes. So they have these goals. Some of them are just beyond the limits of a material imagination or even a mechanical engineer imagination. But the people who are dreaming them up are not engineers necessarily. They're people who you know, watch Star Trek in their youth and they believe that everything on Star Trek is real. So, Okay, I'll see you uh, Monday.